some more again. Um, we should have about 65 by the time we get to next July. Um, so our next talk, so I normally talk about what's coming next and then we talk about what was last and then we talk about tonight. So our next talk is next Tuesday. It is the presentation of the British Army Military Book of the Year Prize. Uh, it will be presented this year by uh, General Ivan Jones, the Commander Field Army. Um, and it will be for Dr. Jonathan Boff's book on um, Crown Prince Ruprecht, who was a German commander in the, in the First World War. He won't be talking about his book, he's already talked about that. What he's going to talk about is the <coughs> lessons for the British Army of today from the First World War and all the things that we haven't learned from. Um, last week's speaker was Dr. Donald Stoker, uh, who has taught at uh, US War College for many years. Um, and talk about his book, Why America Loses Wars, and we'll probably hear a little bit more of that perhaps today. Um, and tonight's speaker, um, I've known Dan for probably about five, six years. Um, he's superb on the drink, I have to say. Uh, <laughs> he's a legend in his own lunch break. Um, but, so Dan runs the, uh, the master's programme at Birmingham University, and it's through them that I got my master's, and if anyone is considering a bit of a Bit of a punch, but anyone's right. considering looking for postgraduate education at, at a high level, distance learning, so you can do it when you're on tour, you can do it when you're away. I can't say enough for that particular course. Um, it's been absolutely exceptional for me, and I know there are lots and lots of soldiers who've benefited from it as well. Anyway, enough of a punt on that. But tonight, Dan is going to talk about counterinsurgency. Mm. Dr. Dan Whitting. Uh, thank you very much, Barney, for that very generous introduction. And of course, um, if any of you are thinking about doing an MA, um, then in an hour's time, after I've droned on, you may well be put off. I don't know. Um, but hopefully you won't be. Um, yeah, uh, Barney was uh, one of our best students, I'm very happy to say. And uh, I think these war talks are fantastic. The standard is very, very high, at least until tonight. Um, Next week, Jonathan Barth, you should all definitely go and see it. Uh, he's excellent, his book is excellent, Crown Prince of Effects, if you haven't read it yet, and um, I'm sure his talk will be an absolute treat, so definitely try to go along to that if you're here. So my subject today, uh, it comes under the rather grandiloquent title of The Past, Present and Future of Counterinsurgency Warfare. Thank you, Barney, for giving me that title. Um, so I wondered what I would do with such a, 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 an overblown title. And I thought I'd start with a quote. In his examination of British interwar imperial policing, British Rule and Rebellion, the book's called, published in 1987, H.J. Simpson, who was a retired colonel turned author, wrote that, and I quote, there is also reason to turn from a general consideration of rule and rebellion under modern conditions to the study of a particular case. The difference between the one and the other resembles the difference between reading and seeing a play. Simpson addressed one of the major challenges confronted by those responsible for transmitting the lessons of war, how to move from particular cases to general principles and then back again. Uh, the fact that the recorder's in my pocket will stop me from putting my hands in my pockets. It's a terrible habit, so I'll keep my hands on the table. Uh, the 9-11 wars in Afghanistan and Iraq brought, uh, brought counterinsurgency, or, or coined for short, into the spotlight, and also highlighted the gap between coin in theory and coin in practice. What was written and taught, what was experienced in theatre, and what was remembered afterwards. Both the US and British armies found their coin doctrines to be outdated, if they even read them at all, and both went through a painful period of attempting to learn on the job, rewriting their manuals following a process of trial and error. As Colonel Alexander Alderson, lead author of the British Army's Doctrine, British Army Field Manual, Volume 1, Part 10, Countering Insurgency, 2009, hereafter AFM in 2009, because I can't be bothered to keep saying the full title, <laughs> uh, he wrote in 2012, Alderson, that it took a long time to agree on what the manual should say and how it should say it. But this was nothing new. Doctrine writers face the challenge of assessing which aspects of the old manuals and principles, that is to say the pre-2001 canon, were still relevant. They had to encapsulate the army's considerable coin experience in Afghanistan and Iraq, but in so doing they faced the tension between generalities and individuals' hard-won experiences of the conflicts, the 
That's not the war I fought syndrome. They also need to produce something that might provide a framework for the future. The complex process described by Alderson demonstrates all of the challenges of writing down any form of doctrine or informal guidance. It takes time, it needs to take account of previous experience, but it also needs to be, as much as it's possible to, future-proofed. So my subject is the story of counterinsurgency, but my interest tonight therefore lies in the manner in which military thinkers, and military thought is not an oxymoron, as you might think, have confronted the challenge of writing about coin. But owing to time constraints, I'm just going to focus on Britain, so leaving the US out, at least, except it relates to Britain. Um, and I'm going to focus on four case studies. So case study one will be the British soldier scholar Charles Caldwell, um, and I have just finished a book about him, which is coming out next year with Cambridge University Press. That's my plug for the evening. Um, and uh, I'll discuss him in relation to his writings on uh, the rising on the Northwest frontier in 1897-98 and the South African War of 1899-1902, otherwise known as the Boer War. Case study two, uh, the British campaigns in Ireland, 1919-21, and Palestine, 1936-39, uh, and then looking at the commentaries of Major General Sir Charles Gwynne and Colonel Simpson, the aforementioned difference between reading and seeing a play. Case study three will be the Malayan emergency, often held to be the paradigmatic example of British counterinsurgency, and the interpretation of the campaign found in the influential work of Robert Thompson. And case study four will be the 9-11 wars in Afghanistan and Iraq and the production of AFM 2009. So some themes for consideration before I begin uh, the first case study. Uh, there is still much more to say on the subject of military thought, especially British uh, this might be in part down to the tricky problem of, as Andrew J. Berthold put it with regard to US military thought, quote, the tracing of the evolution of thought and ideas. But the case studies here demonstrate, and I quote, continuity and change in thought and action and the relationship between theory and practice. There's also the issue of what these case studies might tell us about the purpose of the army. What is the army for? For most of the period under review, the army needed to be ready for a possible major European conflict against Germany or the Soviet Union, but it also needs to be ready to fight small wars, and increasingly, after the British Empire reached the zenith of its territorial extent in 1919, it needed to be able to wage coin against colonial insurgencies. Field Service Regulations, FSR, 1930, noted that, and I quote, the British Empire is confronted with problems peculiarly its own. This consideration affected a range of matters, such as how the army was organised and trained, and of course, its doctrine. A further theme is that it's also questionable just how much we can actually learn from the past. As the US Colonel Jan Gentile has written of Britain's experience in fighting its wars of decolonization, and I quote, the ways to counter these wars of revolution as conceived by writers like Thompson were specific to the time, place, and context in which they were written. Such books and writings should be seen as primary texts and not as contemporary analyses offering templates for action in current and future wars of insurgency. So that's Gentile's view. On the other hand, as Alderson, the doctrine writer for Britain, said in an interview in 2011, and I quote, read it, he's talking here about Thompson's book Defeating Communist Insurgency, published in 1966, and try to ignore the word communist and Vietnam and Malaya. It is interesting that once his theory is laid bare, it is much easier to see why it remains relevant to the insurgencies we face today. I suppose that should not be a surprise because insurgency has always presented a multifaceted problem that requires a multifaceted solution. And that is just what Thompson describes, end quote. So two quite different views there. Of course, how history is used reflects the culture of those using it. Historians of the British Army have noted a preference for informal methods over formal and a tendency to muddle through. And moreover, the idea that there was a distinct British way in counterinsurgency became the standard interpretation until a wave of recent revisionism. History is subjective, as Colin McInnes, among others, warned in 2007, we should not use, quote, history as unchallenged fact in British doctrinal publications. On the other hand, the military thinkers I'm going to talk about today themselves often emphasise that history offers a guide only. There are stories of officers carrying copies of Caldwell and Thompson with them in Afghanistan and Iraq. In Vietnam, General William C. Westmoreland kept a copy of Mao 
supposedly according to his memoirs, on his bedside table. The value of doing this is less clear, and Westmoreland, to be fair, did admit that he never actually had time to read it. <laughs> um, authors like Caldwell and Thompson knew that there was no substitute for good strategy. That is, of course, a clear political aim and a plan to achieve it. So, uh, first case study, uh, Charles Caldwell. Um, now, one of the reasons why I'm very happy to be here this evening uh, is that in 1895, Charles Caldwell gave a, ver a, very, a lecture in this very room. I'm not sure if it's in the exact same spot that I'm standing now, but nonetheless, you can imagine my excitement given that I just finished a book about him. Um, it was a lecture on the subject of small wars, a year ahead of the publication of his most famous book, Small Wars, Their Principles and Practice, which came out in 1896. And I will mention the lecture again later. I haven't just stuck that in there, just uh, for the sake of it. Corwell's book was revised twice, 1899 and 1906. Uh, but Corwell was a theorist practitioner, or maybe a practitioner theorist would be better. Uh, he actually saw action in small wars, most notably in the Boer War, the South African War, of 1899 and 1902. First, he is a gunner officer in Buller's Natal Army during the relief of Ladysmith, successfully, I should say. And then in a series of counter-guerrilla operations, and I should also say they're not entirely successfully. Ian Beckett has suggested that in the book Small Wars, Caldwell, quote, made the only distinctive contribution by any British soldier to the development of military thought in the 19th century. Now, of course, it's questionable, to say the least, whether we can really call Caldwell a coin theorist. And in fact, in the book that's coming out next year, I argue that he isn't one. Of the three categories of small war that Caldwell describes, that is to say, wars of conquest, pacification campaigns, and campaigns to wipe out an insult, avenge a wrong, or overthrow a dangerous enemy, which is a gloriously Victorian way of looking at conflict, only of these three could pacification campaigns be described as related to modern day coin. In fact, small wars is far more concerned with the mechanics of conquest than with colonial withdrawal or current intervention operations the two areas which the canon of coin literature mostly explores. So why have I included him? Well, Caldwell is nonetheless included in the canon of coin theorists by most commentators. Um, and Caldwell did recognise that pacification campaigns often followed conquest. He came to realise also that uh, as the era of conquest came to an end, and of course by 1906, uh, the so-called scramble for Africa was largely concluded, for example, he came to realise that imperial policing operations actually did represent the way of the future at that point. All three editions of Small Wars were published by the Stationery Office as semi-official manuals. The importance of flexibility was demonstrated by the numerous changes that Cornwall made as he updated Small Wars. And all of these changes were based on the things that he was witnessing, uh, either in his, in his reading about the 1897-98 campaigns on the northwest frontier, or in his, in his actual experience in South Africa between 1899 and 1902. So you can actually see him uh, in the space of the uh, in the space of the 10 years between the first and third edition. You can see him change his views based on his own experience, and that then comes back into his into his theory. The 1899 edition included a new chapter on hill warfare, which is very topical in light of what's been going on on the north northwest frontier. And indeed, by the third edition, there are 61 pages in this chapter, which made it the longest in the whole book. Corwell also drew on the notes incorporated in a French translation of the first edition, illustrating the importance of the horizontal spread of established techniques between Western armies. The preface to the third edition was by the then Chief of the General Staff, Sir Neville Littleton. He wrote that Small Wars was, quote, recommended as a valuable contribution on the subject of the conduct of Small Wars, although it was, quote, not to be regarded as laying down inflexible rules for guidance. Nor was it, quote, an expression of official opinion. Indeed, Caldwell wrote to the publisher Blackwood in 1905 that Small Wars was, quote, a treatise and not a textbook to be accepted as gospel. Caldwell's understanding of the difference between how to think and what to think is perhaps best summed up by his aphorism, quote, theory cannot be accepted as conclusive when practice points the other way. Which is a great quote. Caldwell's full of quotable quotes like that. In particular, the third edition, as I've said, included lessons drawn from the South African War. Following initial setbacks in the attempts to relieve the sieges of Ladysmith, Kimberley and Mafeking, the British gained the upper hand and the Boers adopted guerrilla tactics. And the British then had to fight two more years to defeat the Boer 
uh, guerrilla campaign. Counter guerrilla methods such as a scorched earth policy and especially the concentration camps were famously denounced in the House of Commons by Henry Campbell Bannerman as methods of barbarism. But as far as Caldwell saw it, they were useful militarily. He did, however, choose to avoid any serious discussion of the concentration camp policy. He limited himself to only a brief reference in his memoirs. He spoke at greater length about scorched earth. Uh, he believed that this was the easiest way, or the best way, uh, to bring an end to poor resistance, uh, removing them from the sources of supply. The system of drives, using more mobile mounted troops to drive the Boer guerrillas into the nets created by a vast blockhouse system, was hailed by Caldwell as, quote, the last word in strategy directed against guerrilla antagonists. However, he accepted that such methods required elaborate preparation and that this would take an awful lot of time. And that's something actually all the commentators recognised. These kinds of conflicts take time. Um, under such circumstances, he noted that a great deal of latitude had to be left to subordinates in order to carry out the work. And that, quote, in no class of warfare is the need for self-reliant subordinate officers so urgent as in operations of this nature. Now, looking at the very different conditions of the 20th century insurgency, it's possible to see Caldwell's work as being outdated. However, to view the British approach in Caldwell's time as one of exemplary force, even brutality, in a dark age before the more enlightened period of minimum force, that is often regarded to be the hallmark of the British way in counterinsurgency in the post-Second World War period, would be an oversimplification. The extent to which the theory and practice of minimum force formed the basis of British counterinsurgency in the 20th century has been questioned. Hugh Bennett has argued that uh, emphasis on minimum force has come at the expense of a tradition of exemplary force, which is best demonstrated in Caldwell and Caldwell's thoughts. Now, whether or not minimum force was honoured more in the breach than the observance, the methods the British employed in Palestine, 1936 39, 45 47, Malaya, 48 60, or Kenya, 1952 60, such as sweeps and drives and mass resettlement, look more like an extension of Caldwell's tactics rather than a break with them. A second key point to note is that Caldwell saw small wars as having much to teach the army about fighting in general. So the debate about uh, do you prepare for small wars or do you prepare for big ones, Caldwell would have said, well, there's actually less difference than people think. At a time when many commentators saw colonial warfare as irrelevant to the need to prepare for a European war, Caldwell noted that, and I quote, perhaps the most famous quote from the book, the art of war, as generally understood, must be modified to suit the circumstances of each particular case. The conduct of small wars is in fact in certain respects an art by itself, diverging widely from what is adapted to the conditions of regular warfare, but not so widely that there are not in all its branches points which permit comparisons to be established. Cornwell argued that small wars taught vital skills such as self-reliance, which could not be so easily developed by the routine of barrack life, as he called it. Small wars turned the men into soldiers and taught the officers how to use their initiative. In this, he anticipated the field service regulations of 1909, which made very much the same uh, observations. In particular, Caldwell saw the lessons of the South African War as being in many ways more relevant than those of the most recent European clashes, such as the Franco-Prussian War of 1870-71. Indeed, he believed that the Russo-Japanese War of 1904-05 reinforced many of the lessons that the South African War had taught. For Caldwell, coin if we can call it that, for his time, would not weaken the army's preparation for regular operations. Okay, so the second case study, which is Gwyn, Simpson and Imperial Policing. Britain faced a bewildering array of problems in the aftermath of the First World War. Financial and manpower constraints affected its ability to deal with a range of security threats, uh, I'm sure you're all familiar with some of the challenges. Unrest in Ireland, India and Egypt. Uh, Britain also had to police territories won during the First World War, most notably Palestine and Mesopotamia. Having fought a continental war between 1914 and 18, the British Army reverted to its traditional imperial role. The Irish War of Independence, 1919-21, was in many ways Britain's definitive coin experience of the interwar years, and it also offered an example of a successful insurgency against an imperial power. Meanwhile, the complexities of the political situation in Palestine culminated in the Arab Revolt of 1936-39, one of the most significant challenges Britain faced anywhere during the interwar years. 
aid to the civil power, also constituted a major preoccupation of the armed forces during this period, given that Britain experienced significant labour unrest, particularly in the 1920s. A further crucial event came at Amritsar in 1919, where troops under the command of Brigadier General Reginald Dyer opened fire on a crowd which had gathered in the Jallianwala Bagh, killing 379 people officially. As T.R. Mormon has noted, although attention to the subject was not systematic, by 1939 there was a good range of material available on small wars and imperial policing in Britain. Small wars by Cornwall was required reading at the Staff College and recommended reading for the RAF Staff College. Prominent examples of new material included the official Notes on Imperial Policing, published in 1934, Gwynne's book, Imperial Policing, also published in 1934, and Simpson's British Order of Rebellion, which I already mentioned. All of this recognised, as the official manual noted, that the armed forces were, quote, called upon from time to time to carry out operations for the maintenance or restoration of internal peace. Events such as Amritsa and the steady breakdown of law and order in both Ireland and Palestine meant that a major theme of the material available was on nipping trouble in the bud, but without, as much of the material argues, undue severity. As the official notes on imperial policing suggested, quote, the principle which has consistently governed the policy of His Majesty's government in directing the methods to be employed when military action in support of civil authority is required may be broadly stated as the use of minimum force necessary. So the idea uh, of minimum force uh, the idea that this represented the central tenet of British camp insurgency became deeply embedded in the coin literature at this point. Now, Gwynne had been commandant of the Staff College from 1926 to 30, uh, almost certainly had read Caldwell, and was quite possibly involved in writing the official 1934 um, notes on imperial policing as well. He sought to capture the lessons of Britain's extensive experience in his book, Imperial Policing. The first two chapters of the book established key principles with the rest of the book going on to establish a series of case studies. So again, we have this sort of move from the general to the particular. Like Caldwell, Gwynne divided campaigns into three, but he realised that the era of classic small war, the war of conquest, most certainly come to an end. And at the time of writing, the use of the army to restore order, which was his second category, was of special importance. The third category was aid to the civil power. His book, therefore, was about the consolidation of empire rather than its expansion. And it was this role which he believed created the major challenge. Gwynne noted the difficulties of hunting small bands of guerrillas and understood that the population might have divided loyalties, making the job of the counterinsurgent harder. Force could not be excessive, but must be significant enough to demonstrate resolve. He believed that Amritsa had shown uh, that these principles weren't put into action. Dyer had failed to act in accordance with what he saw as, as the British approach. But in Egypt in 1919 and Palestine in 1929, he argued that the principles were largely adhered to. Ultimately, Gwynne was suggesting that exemplary violence would convince opponents, neutrals and loyalists alike, of British determination, and thereby would win the campaign. Now, curiously, Gwynne chose to leave out Britain's experience of Ireland, saying that it would be inadvisable to include it. Uh, now, Rob Johnson notes that this is a serious omission, uh, given that Ireland, if anything, reinforces principles. Uh, he also suggested, and I think this is harder to prove, uh, that the fact that Gwynne's wife was Irish may have had something to do with him leaving out uh, the problem in Ireland. But to save uh, domestic peace, uh, he was willing to sacrifice Ireland in the book. I don't know. Uh, that's, that's one of Johnson's little sides. Um, Simpson, on the other hand, did draw upon Ireland in his book. Um, he coined the term sub-war to describe insurgency which he defined as, and I quote, an organised use of force, partly under arms, designed to get something by force against the will of the properly constituted government. He noted that this existed in acute form in Ireland in 1920-21, and he also highlighted uh, the skilful um, uh, leadership of the insurgency in Ireland during these years. Uh, it was the example of uh, insurgency that had been most skillfully managed by the other side. So he did talk about Ireland. He argued that it was necessary, in order to gain a quick decision, uh, to take the offensive as soon as possible. And he called for systematic combing area by area in order to re-establish control and uh, to coordinate all areas of the counterinsurgency, civil, police, legal and military. Sub-war should be defeated first before any yieldings, he called it. Uh, so that's giving any, granting any political concessions. First of all, you had to win militarily, which is obviously slightly different to the way that Coin literature discusses coin now. 
Um, he argued that it is better to win first and then give. As we've seen, Simpson's reflections on the need to study particular cases provide an interesting perspective on the gap between theory and practice, the difference between reading and seeing a play. Simpson saw British rule as positive, attempting to guide its empire to a state of free cooperation and therefore not, interestingly, imperialist. And he says the word imperialist. He says the British empire is not imperialist. Um, however, in rejecting moderation and calling for prompt measures, his approach also justified the use of exemplary violence. Gwynne and Simpson both saw the Arab revolt as demonstrating how a government showing weakness could cede the initiative. Gwynne was critical in the second edition, 1939, to his uh, imperial policing, as was Simpson, who tellingly described Palestine as, and I quote, an island number two. He criticised, that is Simpson, what he saw as a reactive and conciliatory government, and he called for a greater sense of purpose and better coordination. A general staff report, Military Lessons on the Arab Revolt in Palestine, 1936, came to the same conclusion. In the long run, repressive measures saved lives because conciliation suggested weakness uh, and, uh, in the face of the opponent. The weapon of martial law was, mer was more merciful in the end because, and I quote, the bigger the stick, the less likely is one to, be risk, to risk being struck by it. It is clear that by 1939, Caldwell's ideas regarding the effectiveness of exemplary force, especially when used against peoples whom British commentators saw as less civilised, and that was the word that was used at the time, were still deeply ingrained. Moreover, the preference of both Gwynne and Simpson for solutions based on martial law, even if only de facto martial law, reflect circumstances in which, as Hugh Strawn has put it, the firm smack of government could be freely administered. So to move on to the third case study, these ideas were still influential after the Second World War, but Malaya, as you all know, is often held up as the sort of paradigmatic example of British counterinsurgency, uh, the moment where uh, the British way is firmly established. Now, of course, the British army had returned again to its traditional imperial role in 1945, um, and that the idea that there was this British way in counterinsurgency developed um, as a result of observations of, Brit of Britain's practical experience and its wars of decolonisation, and uh, as a result of the codification of principles based on this experience in the theoretical writing. Perhaps the most famous example of this is the British writer Robert Thompson, who's my third case study, who developed a set of principles based on Malaya and the US war in Vietnam. And his most famous book is Defeating Communist Insurgency, published in 1966. Winning the hearts and minds of the people became a handy catchphrase which seemed to encapsulate the key reason for British success in Malaya, although Thompson's interpretation of two such different wars as Malaya and Vietnam meant that, in his theory, the Malayan example was naturally elevated in comparison to what was going on in, Mal in, in Vietnam. Robert Thompson was, as his obituary in the Times put it, and I quote, widely regarded on both sides of the Atlantic as the world's leading expert on countering the Mao Zedong technique of rural guerrilla insurgency. His reputation, as I've said, rests on the book Defeating Communist Insurgency, but also uh, on his experiences um, as head of the British advisory mission in Vietnam, Briam, from September 1961 to March 1965. So again, we have this interesting comparison between uh, Thompson's experiences in Malaya and in Vietnam and the way that he reflected on these in his book in 1966. Thompson set out five basic principles that the counterinsurgent side must follow. Firstly, the government must have a clear political aim. Secondly, the government must function in accordance with the law. Thirdly, the government must have an overall plan. Fourthly, the government must give priority to defeating the political subversion and not the guerrillas. And fifthly, in the guerrilla phase of an insurgency, the government must secure its base areas first. Now, these five principles, of course, become very famous and have kind of seeped into the canon of, of British counterinsurgency writing. Thompson believed that they had become clear in Malaya. And as David French has suggested, it was Thompson's, quote, seductive analysis that helped to establish Malaya as the model. Incidentally, Thompson actually disliked the term counterinsurgency for the very reason that it suggested the government were merely reacting to something rather than taking proactive steps to confront it. Thompson recognised that Malaya and Vietnam were different. In the former, the British benefit, benefited from the fact that Malaya was smaller, more prosperous, better administered 
and especially that it could be isolated from external support. On the other hand, in Vietnam, there was plenty of recent experience from the French war and potential US support was far greater. The, the, the manpower and material that the US could commit to the Vietnam War was far greater than what the British could commit to Malaya. Thompson also argued that the Republic of Vietnam, South Vietnam, enjoyed the advantage of dealing with its own people in the insurgency. Although here he perhaps erred, in Malaya, the British actually benefited from the fact that the Malayan Communist Party's appeal was largely contained within the Chinese population and not the Malay population. Thompson's time with Brown offers an interesting case study of the difficulties involved in translating coin theory into practice. Ian Beckett's description of Thompson occupying, quote, what might be described as a walk-on part, unquote, in the Vietnam story is very apt. Peter Bush has argued that Brown was the result of a British initiative. It was felt that some contribution to the Cold War struggle against communism was necessary, and that in so doing, Anglo-US relations could be improved. But it was also believed that Britain genuinely had something to offer in Vietnam as a result of its experience in Malaya. As Paul, che as Paul Cheesewright has written, quote, Brian would cost very little, its members would have the expertise to play Greeks to the Romans, and it would show the US and that the UK remained a loyal and sympathetic ally in spite of concerns about the drift of US policy. It offered involvement without engagement, end quote. But Brian was to advise and assist the Rep Republic of Vietnam, but as Bush has noted, its impact on the anti-guerrilla campaign was actually limited. Bush has pointed out that the strategic Hamlet program, although redolent of the new villages that were famously put into, put into use in Malaya, uh, was not actually Thompson's idea, although once he accepted it, he came to believe that victory was imminent. This very optimistic view turned to pessimism as he realised the programme was expanding far too fast and was scattered over far too wide an area. As he wrote in his memoir, Make for the Hills, which was published in 1989, quote, it proved quite impossible to get across to the Americans that the programme should be carried out as an organised, methodical campaign to recover and control territory, end quote. The Republic of Vietnam's leadership had different interpretations as to what the strategic Hamlet programme could actually achieve. Primarily, they saw uh, the strategic Hamlet programme as a way of expanding uh, their own political influence, rather than emphasising the possibility of economic or social development. Thompson grew disillusioned following the overthrow of President Diem in 1963, and, of course, the political instability that followed the overthrow of Diem. Thompson believed that the Vietnamese peasants would reject communism, that South Vietnam uh, simply wanted good government, and that what worked in Malaya would work in Vietnam. Unfortunately, he erred on all three counts. As Cheese Wright put it, and I quote, it required a degree of unjustified optimism to assume that the Malayan experience could be repeated. Briam came to an end in 1965, just as the American Grand War was really starting to hot up in Vietnam. Thompson later praised what he saw as a new focus on pacification and Vietnam Vietnamization later on after the Tet Offensive of 1968, and he argued that the conventional invasion launched by the North in 1972 was the greatest tribute to the progress made in South Vietnam. He argued that the lack of support given by the US after 1973 meant that defeat was snatched from the jaws of victory. As he wrote in his memoir, I had maintained that the Americans could not win a victory in accordance with their concept of war, unless they defeated Hanoi in accordance with its concept of war. You do not win a chess game by playing poker. That's what he wrote in his memoir in 1989. Now, Thompson's analysis at the time clearly impressed President Nixon, who invited him over in 1969, for uh, a meeting to discuss uh, what Thompson could, could, what advice Thompson could actually give. But as uh, General William C. Westmoreland, who commanded American troops in Vietnam from 1964-68, contended, Thompson's guidance was all well and good, but as Westmoreland put it, so many were the differences between the two situations, Malaya and Vietnam, that uh, it was actually quite difficult for the Americans to borrow anything from the British experience. Thompson criticised the US preoccupation with the big unit war in his 1969 study, No Exit from Vietnam. But in Vietnam, as Westmoreland justifiably noted, quote, it was the irregulars that were drawing support from the regulars, 
Certainly, the British were able to defeat the communist insurgency in Malaya. However, coin operations today take place in very different circumstances. One highly significant factor is that Malaya was part of the British Empire, and therefore the necessary governmental structures were already in place to fight the insurgency. Indeed, the era of Malaya and Kenya and all of these other examples that are often cited today passed away with the end of the British Empire. In this respect, Vietnam represented the future in which US forces waged a counterinsurgency campaign in a host country. Moreover, the ability to promise independence was, of course, a major ace in Britain's hand. Um, it could undercut the Malayan Communist Party in so doing. No such political solution was possible in the post-9-11 counterinsurgencies in Afghanistan and Iraq. So the use of counterinsurgency theory from the period of colonial warfare against communist insurgency with the British, within the British and French empires should, of course, be treated with the same caution. However, as I said earlier, Thompson, Thompson himself was very clear. Firstly, uh, the history could only serve as a guide at best. And secondly, that any solution uh, in a counterinsurgency required a, a clear political plan. Um, Thompson's book is not merely a set of operational solutions. So finally, uh, moving on to the last case study, which is the 9-11 wars and the uh, Army Field Manual of 2009. On the 11th of September 2001, hijackers crashed planes into the Twin Towers in the Pentagon. And the wars that followed have been characterised variously as the Global War on Terror, then as the Long War, then subsequently as the 9-11 Wars, or from a British point of view, Blair's Wars. They proved arduous and costly in men, money and material. The British fought in Afghanistan from 2001 and Iraq from 2003. In both cases, initial success and a period of relative calm were followed by prolonged insurgency campaigns. And in both cases, the British struggled and were forced to carry out that most difficult of readjustments, learning on the job. In the British case, the result of this process was a heightened interest in coin in academic, military and popular literature. And a new doctrine, British Army Field Manual, Volume 1, Part 10, Countering Insurgency, 2009. Now, it's important to note that the British Army did go into Afghanistan with a coin doctrine. Counterinsurgency Operations, 2001. It, like the 1996 edition that it followed, was written by Brigadier Gavin Bullock. Of course, the fact that something existed did not necessarily mean that it was read. Hugh Strawn has argued that the 2001 doctrine, and I quote, was perfectly adequate, but it was ignored. Moreover, many authors have argued that the British Army entered the 9-11 wars filled with the myth of its coin brilliance, fostered by dimly remembered historical examples such as Malaya. One of the most trenchant criticisms in this regard was advanced by Frank Ledwidge in his book Losing Small Wars, published in 2011. He contended that many, including himself, had bought into the idea of a British way in counterinsurgency, leading to disillusionment when experience in Iraq revealed major failings at the operational level. One example of British hubris often cited is an infamous intervention made by Brigadier Nigel Owen Foster in late 2005. Owen Foster criticised the US Army for focusing on taking the offensive against the insurgents using technological solutions, for being culturally insensitive, for seeking quick results, with a candor approach that led to damaging optimism, as he argued, and for taking too long to adapt. No doubt these remarks were offered in a spirit of friendship, but he was not alone in making such criticisms. U.S. Lieutenant Colonel John Nagel, whom Aylwin Foster quoted frequently and approvingly in his article, argued in his book Learning to Eat Soup with a Knife, published in 2002, that, quote, the British Army was a learning institution and the American Army was not, end quote. Unsurprisingly, Aylwin Foster's opinions were not universally accepted within the U.S. military. Although, of course, many did see the value of his intervention, not least, of course, General David Petraeus later commander of US Central Command, 2008 to 10, and then ISAF from 2010 to 11. As Thomas Donnelly wrote in 2009, quote, if Brigadier Nigel R.F. Owen Foster didn't exist, Americans would invent him. The fact that key personnel in the US Army coordinated a rethink of their approach, leading to the new US Army Field Manual FM 3-24 in 2006, while the British fell behind, was therefore a cause of some soul searching. The British Army took a decision to revise its doctrine in 2006, but this turned out to be a complex process, as I said at the beginning. 
it was clear that there were gaps in the 2001 version that needed to be filled. The lead author of the New Doctrine, Alderson, has subsequently written about the challenges posed by the range of agencies involved, and the false start that was the MOD's 2007 Joint Doctrine note countering irregular activity within a comprehensive approach, which was rather coolly received. Unlike the US FM 3-24, which emerged out of a methodical formulation of approach and coordination with changing national policy ahead of its publication in 2006, the British Army Field Manual captured the changes that had evolved out of their experiences in Iraq and Afghanistan. Given the apparent preference in British history for informal or unofficial thinking on counterinsurgency, of my case studies, of course the first three today were just that, unofficial, the manner of the production of the Army Field Manual was perhaps something of a departure. Even Bullock, in his survey of Britain's coin history in the Army Field Manual, noted that, and I quote, it was curious to recall that despite the extensive experience gained by the British Army in counterinsurgency during the 20th century, relatively little has been recorded as official doctrine in military publications. End quote. The AFM Army Field Manual began with a clear, began with a clear statement that, quote, counterinsurgency is warfare, end quote. It then put forward ten principles of counterinsurgency. Primacy of political purpose, unity of effort, understand the human terrain, secure the population, neutralise the insurgent, gain and maintain popular support, operate in accordance with the law, integrate intelligence, prepare for the long term, and learn and adapt. That's ten principles to Thompson's five, but some of those points are clearly redolent of Thompson's view, and Thompson is cited uh, several times during the uh, course of the Army Field Manual. The discussion of these principles and the general framework of shapes to develop that encapsulated all of the tasks which the counterinsurgent would need to perform included a range of case studies. Examples from the 9-11 wars were discussed alongside classic campaigns, obviously Malaya in particular. Malaya, the manual noted, quote, provided much of the doctrine for current British operations. End quote. However, the Army Field Manual also cautioned that, quote, it is necessary to be careful about drawing conclusions and applying them to other, often different, types of campaign without an understanding of the appropriate context, end quote. The manual cited Caldwell, Gwynne, and especially, and I quote, the proven counterinsurgency theories, end quote, put forward by Thompson. Um, at times, I think the tone of the Army Field Manual is very measured when it talks about these historical examples, but proven counterinsurgency theories is perhaps pushing it a tad. It's hard to prove anything in history, as I always tell my students. It was generally well received, the Army Field Manual. Petraeus thought it superb, that's a quote. Both the US and British armies got better at coin. However, the work done to remedy some of the shortcomings of British coin could only go so far. As Hugh Strawn has written, and Theo Farrell in his Unwinnable 2017 excellent book about Afghanistan also wrote, the big problems for Britain were at the strategic level and above. The failure to think through its own objectives, other than those of the US, apart from those of the US, the failure to provide the means necessary to wage the wars, and the failure to decide what end state it was actually fighting for. And of course, both the US and the UK were equally guilty of, of these problems. Moreover, it's also worth noting uh, that uh, it has been argued, uh, most notably by MLR Smith and, and Pritchard, uh, that uh, Thompson's views were still applicable for the campaign in Afghanistan and the campaign in Iraq, uh, that you could apply the five principles, but in fact, in all five cases, the British actually failed to apply their own coin principles from the 1960s. Alderson would later describe the effort to promote the understanding of coin as being led, quote, by a small group of activists in itself a form of insurgency, end quote. To that extent, the development of the manual perhaps paralleled the debate between the Crusaders, as Andrew Vesovich called them, and their conservative opponents in the US. The former, the Crusaders, that is, advocated adaptation to meet the problem of irregular warfare, whereas the latter questioned the coin narrative. The former included the aforementioned John Nagel, co-creator of the US FM 3-24, while the latter included Gian Gentile, who I've quoted already as well, who described Coyne as, quote, a strategy of tactics, end quote, in a 2009 essay. Unsurprisingly, Alderson did not agree with this assertion, describing it as, quote, an attractive headline grammar, uh, which he continued, 
did draw attention to one of the inherent dangers of not developing a comprehensive approach to strategy. Lieutenant General Sir Paul Newton, Commander Force Development and Training from 2010 to 12, argued that the frank debate between Nagel and Gentile could not have happened in the United Kingdom, owing to the strictness of MOD censorship. Given the long history of its army publications and the spirited debates that often took place within its pages, this was a rather telling indictment. That being said, such debates can often generate as much heat as light. The US Army went through a similar period of soul searching, after all, as a result of the Vietnam War. And although the US Army has spent most of its time focusing on regular warfare against a peer opponent, it has spent much of its time, perhaps most of its time, away from what is usually described as the conventional battlefield. And the same is true equally, if not more so, of the British Army. So, conclusion. What can we conclude from all of this, and what further questions are raised? The diversity of the case studies that I've discussed here today does raise the question of whether it's possible to speak at all of general principles of counterinsurgency that can be applied in all contexts. Indeed, it is clear that some principles required modification, some extensive modification, and that some principles have simply been thrown out altogether. However, the emphasis in the Army Field Manual on the need to understand context before drawing conclusions based on Thompson in Malaya suggests that at least some contemporary writers are very aware that we cannot treat the past as a source of timeless lessons to be raided. The ideas that have shaped insurgency and counterinsurgency have frequently smoothed over the difficult realities of these campaigns. Yet some of the principles of counterinsurgency warfare have proved remarkably durable. The sweeps and drives of the South African War, as I said, were not so different to the cordon sweep operations that were launched in Malaya or Kenya. On other occasions, commentators found it much easier to read what they were seeing than to discuss future possibilities. Perhaps, of course, we shouldn't be too critical of people's inability to predict the future. Who can? For example, Caldwell recognised that the age of the War of Conquest, when he was writing, was coming to an end, and that technology was rapidly changing. He could not foresee the full consequences of this, and certainly not the counter-revolutionary wars about which Thompson wrote. Similarly, Thompson could not have expected that the principal phenomenon about which he was writing, namely defeating communist insurgency, would soon pass away. The issue of the British Army's role and organisation today remains as contentious as it did in Caldwell's time or in Thompson's. Is it for large-scale operations, small wars? Can it prepare for both at the same time? Finally, more will be written about coin in the future, and more doctrine will follow. The army was caught short in 2001 with an adequate but unread doctrine. The challenge is to ensure that next time, the army does not begin from a standing start. For that, history may not have all of the answers, but it can help us to ask some of the right questions. And when reading the literature on coin, we must always remember that there is, and I quote, a difference between reading and seeing a play. Thank you. So, questions, folks. Who's going to go first? 